I think we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm glad to welcome Lubomir Anamets here. Uh, as far as I know, he doesn't speak often at these actions. It's quite a rare occasion to hear a lecture from him. And uh, he will talk about ecophysiological aspects <coughs> of aquatic carnivorous plants. Dear, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Well, first, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this uh, exhibition for inviting me to it and for persuading me to take part in it, <laughs> because I dislike a bit good lecture. Uh, but first, let me, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lugo Miramets and I have been working for many years, for 30 years, in the Institute of Botany of the Czech Academy of Sciences at Seboni, it is a small sort of Bohemian town in this country. Well, let, let me shortly introduce my, my uh, professional career and the story how how I did start it. Uh, Physiology of aquatic carnivorous plants. So I'm a plant physiologist, basically plant physiologist, and, and I was graduated from the department of plant physiology, which is nearby in the uh, at 1982. And then I was doing my uh, PhD studentship at the Institute of Experimental Botany in Prague working on the plant electrophysiology, but not, unfortunately not on carnivorous plants. And afterwards, uh, I've been working for 33 years in the Institute of Botany at Sheboni. And I have been, I, I, some 20 years ago, I was dealing also with terrestrial, terrestrial carnivorous plant ecophysiology, mainly with mineral nutrition, but I've been dealing almost the whole uh, period I've been, I've been working in the south with uh, ecophysiology of, of aquatic carnivorous plants. When I looked at the, at the at exhibition uh, downstairs in the botanical garden today, I have seen hundreds if not thousands of beautiful and spectacular terrestrial carnivorous plants but to be honest I haven't seen any single aquatic carnivorous plant but out of the total number of about 800 carnivorous plant species recognized up to now about 60 species are aquatic so it is a pity that nobody <laughs> nobody there is one yeah, yeah. But that Almost At nobody. Least. That almost nobody is uh, is uh, interested in grow, uh, growing or exhibition or studying of uh, aquatic animals plants. So my task, my lecture here, should fulfill two tasks. First, I should I should persuade you all that aquatic animals plants are no less beautiful, spectacular curious and interesting as the terrestrial counterpart, uh, the terrestrial counterparts. And for this purpose, I have prepared a small exhibition of red Australian, Australian altervanda, which you could send per Rolam to see. The two plants are from the southwestern Australia. It is the most red, the most red <laughs> population from Australia. From Australia, and you could, you could see the flower buds as well as some maybe the abortus uh, okay. so, And the second, I would say, scientific uh, aim of my, of my lecture is to, is to uh, review some recent items of knowledge from the ecophysiological point of view of aquatic carnivorous plants, which are good shot be shortened under abbreviations ACPS uh, concerning with their growth, <coughs> photosynthesis, 
mineral nutrition, importance of carnivore and investment in carnivore. And I shall try to, to find some and elucidate different traits for each subgroup. What are the difference, differences between terrestrial and aquatic carnivorous plants? Okay, so speaking on aquatic carnivorous plants, it is an ecological subgroup of about 50 to 60 species of only two genera. So their, their systematics is relatively, relatively uh, simple, at least on the generic level. So it is Aldrovanda, monotypic species Aldrovanda, from the family Drosseraceae and Ordo Cariophyllales, and the genus Utricularia having about 56 species, which could be, which could be uh, said aquatic or, uh, or amphibious, belonging to the family Lentibulariase of the order Lamiales. And uh, it, is usually, uh, it is usually accepted that the aquatic species belong to six generic sections of the genus Tricularia. The, the, most, the most abundant uh, sections are uh, the section Utricularia, Pleochasia, which is entirely of Australia, and Vesiguina, which is uh, American. American uh, so, so let's start with Aldrovanda vesiculosa. Yeah. Aldrovanda, as you can see it personally, has a snapping text. And Aldrovanda is a, a, a genetically sister of Dionea muscicula. So you can see the you can see the detail of the chat reminding reminding uh, uh, water wheel. So the so the English name of Aldrovanda is water wheel plant. So it is, there are different different populations. I think there are this an Australian. Strain this is a typical green, green uh, European, maybe po certainly Polish strain of Aldrovanda, temperate strain. Here is an African strain I've been growing from, from uh, Botswana. Here, flowering of Hungarian Aldrovanda. And here, you can see the hybrid between two uh, different populations of of Aldrovanda made by a very skillful Japanese uh, carnival, aquatic carnival plant grower, Mr. Yoshi, Yoshikazu Katagere, and he's, he, he has a produce part about six, uh, 14 uh, hybrids between different populations of Aldrovanda, and this one, which is extremely interesting, is a hybrid of two tropical strains of Aldrovanda originating from from the northern territory. So the parents are the strains from it is L, L so called L V hybrid between Leech Lagoon near Catherine. It is at an inland an inland side of Red Aldrovanda and D is from Darwin in the north of the northern territory. So Although the both, par uh, the bo both parents are entirely tropic populations, the that from uh, Leech Lagoon and or Catherine in the inland does fall to realms, or at least a part of the population. And the hybrid, as you can see, does also form dormant through to realms. Strange, isn't it? So, uh, I have uh, just a moment. I have a, I have a, uh, forgotten to mention that my work on aquatic carnivorous plants and and their ecological studies at my Institute of Botany in Szczegony is mainly based on on the fact that uh, we have the world's largest collection of aquatic carnivorous plants uh, in the Institute or in the in the department at Trebon. and Now it includes 21 
world populations of Aldra Banda and over 30 species of aquatic Utricularia. Totally it has over 80 items of species and different populations. Using using this using this uh, collection, I was able I was able to do uh, many many uh, studies. Without the collection, it, the study couldn't be possible. So, and Utricularia it has a different type of traps so called suction traps with uh, negative pressure and or under pressure inside. And I think that one whole lecture, uh, several hours long, could be could be theoretically devoted to the biology of, of uh, these traps because the traps are, although they are the smallest among carnivorous plants of all of genera, they are probably the most sophisticated and most uh, interesting and curious interesting and curious plants as to their structure and functioning. So the different you can see different examples of uh, different examples of uh, aquatic utricularia, utricularia australis, which is maybe one of the most common carnivorous plant over the world because it grows relatively frequently on four continents, except four American subcontinents. And near African Utricularia reflexa from Okavango Sven, from Botswana. And uh, this, this species is very, very valuable for me because, as you can see, it has only a relatively small amount, but very large traps. The traps have normally and regularly six millimeters. And they, can, they can be very, very very suitably used for any kind of research. Well, you can see, you can see bubble inside this trap. If, if the traps are irritated uh, under uh, in air, instead of water, they can suck air bubble. Well, and here, an example of the, our native Utricularia intermedia, which has a two kinds two types of shoes, photosynthetic without traps, and carnivores with many traps. And perhaps American Utricularia inflata, and the species which is not invasive both in New Zealand as well as in, in the Rhine Valley in Western Germany. And what all these plants are uh, entirely submerged up except for Utricularia intermedia, which is most, which is more or less amphibious. Both Aldrovanda and Utricularia are, and most of Utricularia, aquatic Utricularia species, are fixed to, to the atmosphere, it means to the, to the area environment, uh, in the case of flowering, yeah? Both are Aldrovanda flowers as well as Utricularia, Flowers, this Utri American Utricularia macroriza are opened above water for pollination. Okay, and I, I, have, uh, had, I have added a notice on the Czech species of aquatic, aquatic Utricularia, so aquatic uh, carnivore species that. In this country, there are natively eight species of that subgroup, but six of them are critically endangered. Utricularia minor is only strongly endangered, while Utricularia australis is, is not endangered. It is, it is extremely common and made up over 1,000 sites within our small country. Let's start to, to postulate some basic or principal ecophysiological differences between aquatic and terrestrial carnivorous plants. Uh, but the, these differences are independent of the threat type and should be should be general for for the, for the uh, both subgroups uh, against each other. So aquatic carnivorous plants. 
can, can be characterized by rapid growth, high growth rate, and available mainly vegetative propagation, and seed set is rarer. Uh, out of the se seven uh, Czech or Central European area species, I think only seven species. So only Utricularia vulgaris and minor set seeds, otherwise the other four or five species are sterile. So uh, for reaching a very high growth rate and rapid growth, they have a very high photosynthetic rate, I shall specify it later. They overwinter in mobile turions in temperate species. And I have, a, I have a enumerated that, or evaluated that out of total seven, 17 species which grow in, in uh, temperate regions, at least in, on the northern hemisphere, 12 of them, it means 71% form dormant rayons. So the remaining species uh, do not form rayons. For example, Tricularia inflata, the highly invasive species, doesn't form rayons, but can survive even our European winter. Okay, why the terrestrial carnivorous plants, on the contrary, mostly slow growth low, and therefore low relative growth rate and they mainly reproduce generatively have a common seed set have a very low photosynthetic rate and they overwinter in immobile dormant high granule in temperate species yeah. but uh, both turions and Hibernum UE are organs, are overwintering organs, which have a good <coughs> storage function, and they are both homologous, they are shortened, shortened shoot APCs, but the difference, so they have the same function, but they have a different uh, terminology. Turions are uh, is a term used for aquasic plant species, whereas hibernaculi are organs of the same function and homology, which uh, are affixed to the ground. You know, for example, uh, for example our Pinguicula and Drosera species form hibernaculi. So, the, the difference, the ecological difference, the only difference between turions and heart and hibernaculi is in that turions are uh, sooner or later uh, detached from the mother shoots and they are mobile so they can act as a propagulus. Well, it, it may be interesting to, to try to, to characterize the, the both subgroups from the, from the ecological strategies uh, after grime these are uh, Rudera com competitive and uh, stress strategy. And it may be also graphically uh, evaluated. So, aquatic carnivorous plants are mostly, uh, mostly competitive and Rudera strategies with only some small bias to, to the stress. Whereas, Whereas terrestrial carnivores, some carnivores plants you can imagine, Rosera, Saracenia, whatever else, are mainly competitive, stress strategy, and the Rosera strategy is uh, avoided in this subgroup. So we are we are now back at the now we shall be speaking now only uh, on uh, aquatic carnivorous plant species. So first let's characterize the typical species. We can, especially in Central Europe, those are in, I don't know those are in tropical or exotic countries, but they may look similar. So they, they are the typical typical habitats of Algrovanda in uh, South Bohemia in the Tsebon Basin and it is a layout of uh, 
artificial sides of Andromeda, where Andromeda was introduced, to which Andromeda was introduced in the mid 90s. Detail of this stand. Now the, the layout of the of the uh, sites is quite different because all the the sites uh, have been rather eutrophicated and overgrown by tall vegetation. Remember the first lecture uh, spoken by my colleague Tomasz Hai. Yeah, a typical, typical against stance of Aldrovanda, the Sikorosa, this stand. And it is, I think it is from Switzerland, again, the stand of Aldrovanda and Utricularia species. And here it is a very shallow stand of Utricularia australis, which I told you earlier, it is very common in this region. So, how how to characterize the typical habitat? So they are shallow, standing, dystrophic waters. Dystrophic means that the water is brownish due to some concentration of humic acids or kinds. You can realize a diluted T or B area. So it's a typical color of the waters. Usually, they have usually low concentration of mineral nitrogen, phosphorus, and sometimes also potassium. In the waters, the concentration of mineral nitrogen is low, but uh, there is a high uh, proportion, uh, ratio between ammonia, ammonia uh, nitrogen and nitrate. Uh, uh, nitrate nitrogen. Usually, usually uh, nitrate nitrate concentration approaches to zero, and but even this concentration is, is relatively low. But, on the contrary, due to, due to the fact that on the bottom there is a high amount of organic, slowly, slowly decomposable material as a litter of these halophytes, yeah, such as reeds and so on, uh, functioning as a slow-release fertilizer, CO2 is permanently released from the organic bodies and we can measure high CO2 concentration in the water. It is, it is uh, very important for the ecophysiology of the plants. Now, let's, have a, let's speak something about the, about the morphology of these, of these plants. So, the linear shoot structure is typical for, for this plant group and some Growth characteristics follow from the structure. So we can we can define that all according to species are rootless, <coughs> evident. But they can they can either free fl uh, freely flow to the surface like Aldrovanda or some Aquaria species, or at the below the surface, or they can be loosely or more or less loosely attached to the sediment mainly. By these carnivorous shoots. Uh, yeah. It is Utricularia floridana from the south of the USA, or it is again Utricularia uh, intermedia. So while the, uh, these are carnivorous shoots, at least in our European species, grow more or less uh, horizontally on the top of the surface or in shallow water, they are up to 15 centimeters long carnivorous shoots bearing many, many dozens of crabs grow uh, perpendicularly or in this in this angle to, to the loose substrate, thus keeping the plants yeah, affixing them to the bottom. Okay. So uh, but it's it's necessary to it's necessary to tell that out of the total uh, number of about six, 60 species of, of uh, aquatic carnivorous plant, and mainly and Utricularia, because Aldrona is strictly submerged species, most of them are in fact amphibious. It, it means that they can grow 
either as fully submerged in shallow water or when necessary they, they can grow also a pretty long period of the season, also the whole seasons under suitable conditions, on the, on the top yeah, of, of the wet substrate, like and in between of, for example, Drosera plants. Yeah? So we can find Drosera and the tree at aquatic area in area on, on the one spot or micro site. So it is necessary to keep in mind that, that most of them are amphibious. Not, not, I think that more than a half are in fact amphibious. What are the amphibious species in the top floor? Only Algrovanga, Utricularia australis and Utricularia vulgaris are strictly submerged. Yeah, the other five Utricularia species are very well amphibious. So, they have mostly linear shoes with modular structure. The, the, the units, the, repeat, the, the repetitive units contain inter, internode and leaf world, leaf node with, with leaves wearing traps. Yeah? This, the modular structure is, is well characterized both in other one node and in particular as well. This, yeah? Internode and node with leaves. Shoots may be either monomorphic or homogeneous, homogeneous or non-differentiated in Altrovanda or some Tricularia species. It means the same type of shoot bearing which fulfills both photosynthetic function and carnivorous function yeah, in Altrovanda or here. This Australian Tricularia austeralis. But or they can be dimorphic or heterogeneous or differentiated into photosynthetic shoots with only a few traps or entirely without traps in the case of Utricularia intermedia and special uh, carnivorous shoots yeah. here in Floridana or intermedia bearing yeah, many traps. Usually, well, I think these are these are plants were taken from from my um, collection or culture, and their traps were growing under sun. Yeah? Therefore, they are pigmented. But normally, if they grow in the sh in the shade, yeah, in the loose substrate, they are usually pale, yeah, like they are whitish, pale without achlorophylls. It, it's, uh, I would like to, to describe you the typical, typical uh, shoot growth system in aquatic carnivorous plants. I have a, I have a call it conveyor belt shoot growth system. So these are plants grow permanently, permanently, very uh, rapidly on in their apices, and the new and the daily growth can produce up from one to 4.5 or 4.5 leaf whorls a day. Yeah. It is a very, very rapid growth rate and to be honest, I don't know any other uh, submerged aquatic plants to grow s so rapidly. Apically. Yeah, it is very, very, very high growth. The, the record month among aquatic carnivorous plants as to this parameter is our common Utricularia australis. So, uh, but permanently they grow very, uh, very uh, rapidly, uh, apically, but simultaneously they have, uh, they have permanent basal shoot aging and decay. So, if they reach the maturity, their length is more or less constant and they will grow like on the conveyor belt. They produce new uh, segment, uh, shoot segments in the apex and they decay at the same rate onto base, yeah? so that, that their uh, length is plus minus uh, uh, constant. So, but in the, in the spring, they, when, when they start from the turion, there is no decay, and 
the plant only increase is it only increasing uh, its length up to reaching maturity and then the laser segment starts to decompose and decay and on uh, at the end of the growing season when the plant again starts forming turions the apex stops growing while the, the basal shoot segments starts decomposing yeah so the shoot length is decreasing again up to the size of the turion yeah this is this process occurs either during the autumnal, autumnal time or during winter when the mother shoots are usually decomposing and decaying and allocation of new plant biomass goes to branching and flowering. Yeah. We have seen some flowers in Rwanda in the Australian Council in the aborted capsule in Rwanda. And here you can see branches. Yeah. It's very important yeah, for, for the plants. Yeah. Branch, one branch, second branch, and the branch for here. Yeah. The Tularina Krolka, on the other branch, another branch. Flowering okay. uh, usually doesn't take a lot of uh, biomass, and moreover, many, many species are sterile. But branching is rather regular under optimal conditions, and we can, we can uh, uh, recognize or estimate branching rates which is defined as number of leaf whorls between two successive branches. So it is the distance, yeah? One, two, three, four, five. So in this case, the branching rate is five for this, for this other one that should. Or branching frequency. So it is, a, it is the parameter expressing the time which is necessary for producing or formation two successive two successive uh, branches. Yeah? If it is Altravanda and uh, we have a five branching rate is five, five uh, internodes. And assuming that the growth rate, the article should growth rate is one one uh, leaf node or internode a day, it takes Every five days, a new branch is uh, initiated. Yeah, you understand this principle. Yeah. So, but the branching as a whole is branching frequency or branching rate. Number simply number of branches per one plant is a very is a very important criterion of growth rate and of the bigger of plants. If you find plants which don't Branch means that they cannot uh, they cannot uh, propagate because branching is the main is the main way of propagation. <coughs> I have a, I have prepared uh, summarized some some uh, data from literature and for branching rates, which are the number of internals between two successive branches in these plants from the literature. So here you can see. Different the shoot date, the shoot type. So for Aldrovanda, it is very regular, and Aldrovanda held the branching rate be between five and six, six uh, internodes. And it's interesting that in Tricularia stigia, <coughs> there is a great difference between branching rates of photosynthetic and carnivorous shoots. Yeah. Carnivorous shoots branch much uh, much more uh, frequently or in for intermedia that is the same. Whereas the branching rates for stigia and intermediate for the photosynthetic shoots is from 12 to, to, to 17 uh, 17 uh, longer more. But for for uh, here today data listed for Tricularia Australis showed that 
there are uh, there may be differences between different populations or different experiments and the, the branching rates may be only some six six uh, internodes but also 20, 20 or more yeah. and this is, here is the branching rate for branching the branches of the Utricularia australis so again very frequently so we can you can take as a whole message that branching rates are species specific in this in the plant and also ecologically regulated. Yeah, it depends on uh, the differences, but evidently, uh, evidently uh, caused by differences in ecology of these plants and their habitats or in the, in the experiments. Now we can speak about the rapid growth rate of the carnivorous plants. But the rapid growth rate of uh, generic is a number which is uh, lesser than one, and it is it is difficult from the mathematical point of view. It is very difficult to realize yeah, its its value. So it's better to, to work with doubling time of biomass or doubling time of biomass or doubling time should be the disease which is defined as, or labeled as T2, and it is an inverted value of relative growth rate multiplied by the factor of 0.69. So it means number of days which is necessary for the plant to, re to reproduce, to, to double its biomass by, so to, to increase the two APCs by. And in most species, it is between 6 to 20 or up to 30 days in summer under optimal conditions. This value is comparable with medium between from 9 to 19 days in the rooted, temperate, submerged, non, non carnivorous plants. So it can be it can be postulated that the Growth rate of aquatic carnivorous plants is, is comparable with the growth rate of uh, aquatic non carnivorous plants, which are usually rooted. But in contrast, a relative growth rate of terrestrial carnivorous plants, but the, the data is relatively poor for, for this, uh, for this uh, subgroup. And the data for three species and ten Saracenia species from, from Aaron Alesson, uh, we, can, we can come to the conclusion that the medium doubling time of biomass for the terrestrials is between 20, 28 to 35, but the range is much wider yeah, towards much slower growth. So, it is, it is quantitatively expressed that what I tell at the beginning that the terrestrial carnivorous plants grow, grow compar comparatively with the aquatic very slowly. And here again, Polish Andromanda from the Pennsylvanian introduced site with open, with, with open traps. And here perhaps Nicolaria Brain. Which, have a, which may have a slow in, a part of indication of carnivorous shoes. So here you can see you can see in this uh, a bit confusing table you can see the, the doubling time of biomass of total shoot shoot APT from a radiation and mean or median values are shown. So uh, here you can see the values for aquatic carnivorous plants which lay within the range I told you between 6, say between 6 and 28 but Utricularia purpurea is, a, is an exception because, because its growth is, is uh, <coughs> rather low, slow, slow growth. Yeah, and here you can see figurally the values for the 
Rudit Samaj, known carnivorous plants, it's very similar. And another, another literature study is about this. I have, a, I have a try to persuade him that aquatic carnivorous plant as opposed to the terrestrial ones grow very rapidly. They have a linear, linear uh, root and what does it grow, what does mean, does it require that they are very rapid apical growth? They are rootless. Keep, let's keep it into our mind. It, it requires a high photosynthetic rate for efficient reutilization of carbohydrates from senescence shoots. Yeah? Otherwise, they still will attain a high growth rate. Well, the first, the first case is, is true. They, the, their very rapid growth means losses of structural as well as non structural carbohydrates carbohydrates from their senescent shoot, so they must have a very, very efficient, uh, very high photosynthetic rate, so as to supply the plant with, with uh, organic uh, substances. It's very rapid growth also requires efficient reutilization of mineral nutrients from senescent shoots, yeah, that's so true, and Catching of prey is one of the is one out of the adaptations which also helps them to keep the high growth rate. We shall quantify it later. The growth characteristics of uh, aquatic carnivorous plants reflect very steep physiological polarity along with their shoes. The polarity includes different different uh, items or different processes. So let's let's have a look at the the typical autumnal plants of Aldrovanda vesiculosa, maybe in September. This, this is a Ukrainian strain from near Chernobyl. And you can see that here is the apex in the form of turions or developing still unripe, unripe turion. And here is a very steep physiological polarity from the youngest organ to the to the oldest shoot segments which are which are dead. According to grand gradient, we can say six or eight centimeters it is very steep in the plant. Especially for Aldrovanda, which is relatively short. The topolarity includes tissue mineral nutrient content, yeah that's true. That's true. Carbohydrate content, yeah, it is also true. Metabolic activity, photosynthesis, gradient of photosynthesis and or drug respiration it also, it also takes place. And it also should include some gradients of uh, phytohormones to, to uh, keep this polarity in function. Well, we can we can shortly sometimes very very quickly. Uh, we can have shortly have a look at the photosynthetic characteristics of of the aquatic carnivorous plants. They are they are all free carbon free species. They are strict CO two users, and their CO two compensation points of photosynthesis for other wonder in this range in different species in this, within this range are very well comparable with the photosynthetic affinity to C2 carbon dioxide which have been measured in many, very many aquatic non-carnivorous plant species like Elodea canadensis and others. So <coughs> the same affinity as for other aquatic plants. <coughs> but what is what is important? Uh, they, the uh, the carnivorous plants have a very high maximum photo 
photosynthetic ready of the reagent should stop using 40 to 160 millimoles of oxygen per kilogram of fresh weight per hour. So, if we convert to, to dry weight, yeah, this within these values, it's very high. It is record, record high for aquatic plants. Only in aquatic most continuous antipyretica uh, attain such a, such a high photosynthetic rate per, per dry weight. The upper range within submerged non-carnivorous non plants is only within 30 to 110 milligrams per kilogram per kilogram per hour of per fresh weight. Aquatic carnivores are higher. Whereas the maximum net photosynthetic rate in 22 terrestrial species from six genera, they could be consolidated, reach only this value of this value of the photosynthetic rate per dry weight. So if you compare that, this range with that range, it might be 10 times or 8, 3 times to, to 10 times lower. Yeah, so the terrestrial species have a slow rate and have a slow, slow rate of photosynthesis, whereas aquatic plants have a grow, high growth rate and high, very high photosynthesis. Uh, aquatic carnivorous plants have a tracks which which may which may have a pro relatively high proportion, usually from 20 to 60 percent. Yeah. So uh, we, we raise a question: What is the what is the dark photosynthesis or dark respiration of tracks of aquatic carnivorous plants? So, it is, uh, it is uh, acknowledged that it is admitted that uh, the tracks uh, have a high to represent high metabolic costs for carnivores of these plants. And for example, total track respiration, total plant, resp total track respiration in three Pricularia species, I think it's Australis, Intermedia, Estivia uh, represented about two thirds of the total plant dark respiration. So, it, this, these are very high figures only demonstrate high metabolic costs of carnivore and high metabolic activity of the traps of carnivorous plants. It is leaves of Utricularia vulgaris is I think in Plata and Australis. Some some figures. So green green letters or green figure green letters for photosynthesis and the dark respiration is in a blue in violet. So, in Aldrovanda, the leaves have a high photosynthetic rate, but as well as tracks of Aldrovanda have a high photosynthetic rates. Uh, rate. But uh, Aldro, dark respiration of Aldrovanda leaves are much lower. Then, then photosynthesis, so photosynthesis is able to overweight the respiration of leaves. The situation in Utricularia is, uh, is very striking. So leaves or leafy shoots have a high photosynthetic rate, whereas the tracks have a very low, very low photosynthetic rate. Even under very optimal or su suitable conditions, stable conditions, the photosynthesis of Tracks is always maybe only the 12 percent of, of that of the leafy shoots. Yeah. And if, if we compare
where there are respiration of leaves, it is, it is very small, but the respiration of traps is two times to three times higher than that of leaves. So again, it is a confirmation that the uh, metabolic activity of the of tra of utricularia traps is very high and the utricularia traps cost the plant a lot of uh, metabolic energy. Now, we, we can tell shortly something about mineral nutrition of aquatic carnivorous plants. So, they are adapted to preferential uptake of ammonia over nitrate when both uh, components are equilibrium distributed. There is a high efficiency of nitrogen uptake from trade, uh, but only one study is available here because the figure is based on uptake of nitrogen, of labeled or heavy nitrogen in particular vulgar extracts from mosquito larvae. It was a very nice, <coughs> skillful uh, study. And we can postulate that they have a very efficient nitrogen and phosphorus reutilization from senescent shoots, but these plants lose all potassium, calcium, and magnesium from their, from their senescent shoots. I have prepared a table uh, which can demonstrate this uh, either above uh, either this conclusion. So, here you can see uh, uh, elemental tissue content in Arthrovanda shoots or Tricularia australis shoots in the apex, in young shoot segments and in old shoots nearly decaying. Yeah, and this is the uh, elemental content in percent of the dry weight. Yeah. So, you can see the steep gradient in that for nitrogen, phosphorus, but no, no gradient for potassium, no gradient or reverse, inverse gradient for calcium, and no gradient for magnesium, and from the same situation for the Tricularia australis. What does it mean? It, it does mean that if we compare either, either values or now between the young shoot segments and the old shoot segments, this uh, reutilization efficiency is high for nitrogen and phosphorus in both genera. But it is zero for potassium, calcium, or magnesium. Concluded. So, what does it mean that if the plants grow very uh, rapidly, they effectively reutilize nitrogen and phosphorus so that they need to take up the novel only a smaller part of nitrogen and phosphorus to. to attain their growth rate, but they do need to take up all potassium, calcium, and magnesium either from the water by, by the shoots or from the prey by their traps for uh, enabling the high growth rate. Well, the high, high efficiency of nitrogen phosphorus reutilization was also found in, in the case of Aldrovanda turium, yeah, over 90% uh, for uh, autumnal or Aldrovanda. Uh, now, we, speaking of mineral nutrition, we should, we should also tell something about mineral investment in carnivore. So, usually investment in carnivore is understood as a proportion of biomass. It tracks uh, the relatively to the, to, to the total plant biomass. But it is, there are not only uh, organic uh, substances, but also mineral substances which are, which are stored or contained in tracks. And it is reasonable to, to speak also on mineral investment in carnivore. 
It means a proportion of mineral nutrients which are allocated to tracks yeah, in the total plant nutrient region. And here is, a, here is the situation in several uh, aquatic animals plant species. Uh, it is organ, tracks is TR, and C, CA is carnivorous. Carnivorous shoot. So here is the investment in carnivore in percent of the of the of the of the, of the track, track structure or track proportion by weight. And here you can see the figures for the mineral investment in carnivore. So it is it may be it may be uh, concluded that the tracks represent relatively high cost for phosphorus and potassium, but in Algravanda also for nitrogen, calcium, and magnesium. Yeah, but in, in different tricularial species, the, the highest proportion is for phosphorus and potassium. So it's, it, it's interesting that the, that the plant must invest over one half usually over one half of these are rare and valuable elements into, uh, into traps to, to keep their carnivore, carnivorous functions. Okay. What is the importance of carnivore for aquatic uh, carnivorous plant growth? Uh, you certainly know that if you if you feed your terrestrial carnivorous plants on different kind of prey that you your plants in your in your aquaria grow much faster than as compared as compared to non-fed plants. The situation in aquatic carnivorous plants is similar, and I have uh, prepared one experiment with the results of one experiment on a Polish outer wanda greenhouse that my colleague uh, Richard Kaminski in Warsaw in Poland and uh, only shortly or simply uh, parameters as plant length and the dry weight, the final dry weight are um, shown. So controls is labeled to 100 percent and Adding of additional zooplankton to the plants uh, strongly increased both the plant, plant length as well as uh, plant weight. Addition of only carex uh, rhizomes, which might enrich the plants in CO2, again, very strongly uh, stimulated growth both in terms of plant length and dry weight and if these treatments were combined zooplankton to carex rhizomes uh, the effect was uh, synergistic uh, here you can see that the plant, plant went from two and a half higher and the dry weight when it was more than three times greater well, it is a layout of outer wonder in some in some experiment when the plants were were fed on a big ostracod animals. Well, here an, another set of experiments is summarized for outer wonder and Victoria Australis in, in different experiments. So shortly, fed Set Aldrovanda plants are heavier, longer, grow much faster, both uh, totally as well as uh, apically. And what you can see here, the crucial difference is in branching. Yeah. Unfed plants didn't branch, fed plants did branch frequently. But there is there is a strange situation in you know, explained so far that unfed plants had a higher nitrogen and phosphorus nutri nutrient content in their uh, young tissues in their young tissues 
it has been it has been not it hasn't been explained so far. Well, I can similar for contemporary Austrians against the third class were longer uh, group faster radically and branch more but the, the difference was not, was not so was not so steep as for Rwanda, and again the paradoxal result in as to the nitrogen and phosphorus content in, in young shoot segments yeah? and the plants had a much higher content than the plants and these differences were usually statistically significant. So yeah, only short look at the layout of the experiments yeah? so in the main Main container of about two and a half square meter large, planted with common reed, which is Australis and Sassages. And the, the plants with spray were growing in the free water, whereas the plants uh, without spray grew on the floating and fissures. So here, control plants with spray, here the experimental plants. And this was another experiment done in, in our greenhouse in two plastic containers. Other one is the Victoria Australis. It looked like this. Victoria Australis shoot segments, other one the shoot segments at, at the start of the experiment and after 11 days. Good spray, without spray, otherwise all factors were the same and it seemed that the plants with spray were bigger, um, more branched, there was no branching in our one. But in Utricularia, but the Utricularia, the differences were not, were not so uh, distinct. So, it's possible to conclude that catch of prey is crucial for the growth rate of uh, aquatic carnivorous plants, especially for branching, and that Aldrovanda is more dependent on prey capture than triploria. Yeah? Aldrovanda uh, deprived of, of prey grows relatively poorly. The, the, but the effect of catch, catching of prey on photosynthesis of aquatic carnivorous plant is unclear. It was the, uh, yeah, the plants from this, from this cultivation were then used for measuring of photosynthesis. And it, it, is, it is interesting that catching of prey decreased chlorophyll content in leaves of all species. Again, so the, what, what, is, what is the influence of uh, prey, of uh, prey capture to photosynthesis in terrestrial carnivorous plants? Now this it is uh, considered that prey capture stimulates photosynthesis in terrestrial plants, but the situation is unclear in aquatics. It stimulated photosynthesis in outer Wanda, but decreased photosynthesis in Utricularia australis. So other experiments are expected to, to solve this question. Yeah, and uh, uh, it was also possible to estimate seasonal or daily nutrient gain consumption from prey <coughs> percent. It is the, the percentage uh, which can be percentage of the con of the daily or seasonal consumption which can be covered from prey. And in Utricularia macroriza in this continent in America, it could be up to 75% for nitrogen. In Utricularia foliosa in Florida, in a very bad a very barren site. It was only very negligible amount. So it, it was also possible to, to design a 
nutrient model and to, to, uh, to estimate mathematically how much how much nitrogen phosphorus can be taken up by capturing and using one ray of zooplankton for outer water and tripleria of australis. But I think that we can we can time is running quickly and we can go on it. What is important for for the ecophysiology of aquatic carnivorous plants? Both Aldrovanga and Tutricularia have a lot of uh, tracks which, which represent about one third of the total plant biomass. Yeah. So we, we shall ask how is the stru structural investment in carnivore in aquatic carnivorous plants, especially in Tutricularia regulated? The tracks, the tracks usually in, say, in European tripular species represent from 10 to 62% of total, total plant dry biomass, usually 25 to 15, usually between 30 to 40 percent. So, all the plants, but it is, there is uh, relatively common that you can find for example, Tricularia australis completely without traps. If the plants grow in a very, very deep shape, or if the plants are fertilized by nitrogen, they completely, they completely, uh, they completely lose their traps. So you can see Tricularia reflexite, African, African plant huge traps, Zambia, and the shape of the plants from an aquarium up with up to eight millimeter big big traps and plants taken from in vitro culture where they have a grow on sugars, big differences. So the, the plants need to regulate the trap proportion flexibly according to the environmental conditions so as they have a, the maximum profit on the track they, so that they have to invest the minimum yeah, for their structure and also their maintenance costs. It has been found that the regulation is relatively weak for Aldrovanda. Aldrovanda traps uh, have a different, different size, but the proportion of the biomass is relatively weak, but I think relatively little is known for outer one. The main, the main uh, pieces or items of knowledge are for different particular species. So the regulation is strong for particular uh, This table lists uh, different uh, for different species, different uh, ecological influence, different ecological factors for the change in investment in carnivore. Well, the, the first set of data for Tricularia foliosa from Colombia, from streams, water is a bit, is a bit unclear. Uh, how, to, how to evaluate the data, but addition of nitrate greatly minus means decrease of investment in carnivore or great prey availability again catching of prey increase the uh, investment in carnivore. But in in other species we can we can tell consistently that any addition of prey or some mineral fertilization leads to decrease in investment in carnivore body. But on the contrary, if the plants grew at high, under high CO2 conditions, the uh, investment in carnivore was greatly stimulated. So we can, we can conclude that there is an inverse proportional relationship between mineral nutrient availability and track proportion. And finally, it was found that there is a negative feedback in the regulation of track proportion 
found in field grown Victoria Australis. And it was found that it is tissue nitrogen content in young shoots, which is the main, uh, you say, the, the main factor, main endogenous factor, which acts as the key regulatory factors for for uh, regulation of investment in carnivore. All nutritional influences which decrease uh, shoot nitrogen content simultaneously increase the proportion of traps and vice versa. And so in Australia it is nitrogen, but whereas in Bulgaria the main tissue element is phosphorus. And utricularia foliosa, there are both. Both nitrogen and phosphorus can regulate uh, or their tissue content can regulate proportion of traps. But uh, it has been known in, in several utricularia species under study that trap size is regulated more than a trap number. Trap number is more or less constant. And it was the CO2 availability which regulates the threat proportion much more than prey, prey addition or availability. It could be, it could be concluded that the photosynthetic regulation of the investment of carnivore, which is given by the CO2 availability, is superior to the mineral regulation by the nitrogen and phosphorus content. And thus it can be it can be uh, claimed that high photosynthesis is the key prerequisite for high investment in carnivore. So, uh, it is a uh, photo of a Utricularia australis from an oligotrophic sand pit, a tribune area, growing under all CO2 conditions, and the investment in carnivore is relatively low, but 15% only. Yeah, because uh, there, is, there is a low concentration of CO2. So, uh, let me tell some conclusions of my lecture. Uh, we are, we are uh, I'm extending my time. Okay. So, the main benefit of carnivore in aquatic carnivorous plants is the gain of nitrogen and phosphorus from prey. It's evident. Uh, carnivore in aquatic species increases neither photosynthesis per unit dry weight nor leaf nutrient content as we as was demonstrated. So thus the physiological response to carnivore neither takes place in adult leaves shoots nor stimulates photosynthesis per unit dry weight. It was a, it was the original theory suggested by English uh, and collaborators in 1984. But instead, it is possible to hypothesize that the response to, to carnivore should lead to growth, growth stimulation of young, small, uh, growing centra in shoot APCs. And the, 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 there was a theory that the increase. Nitrogen and phosphorus availability in apical meristems, so in very small <coughs> parts of, um, of the shoot agencies, shall stimulate the growth <coughs> associated with, with fast, with fast uh, shoot growth, like cell division, DNA, DNA replication, transcription, proteosynthesis, etc. And that these processes might be stimulated, thus enabling the plant's faster growth. I have, a, I have a, <coughs> tried to confirm this theory for three species, for other one and for two particular species, but only it might be confirmed only for as based on the data, only for other one, but not, not for particular species. Again, some red Aldrovanda Australian, Utricularia reflexa jack, a huge trap, <coughs> variant named by Andreas Fleischmann, that this 
acolo te șuți, sau cum trebuie culoarea cu un bol pe ei. Atât tu trebuie să ne vii over free, nu e nimic de plagi. So, a very, a very good lecture should be, should be ended by some inspirations or proposals for parts of research. So, uh, I do the questions which should, which could or should be studied uh, are if carnivore of aquatic carnivorous plants leads to stimulation of mineral nutrient uptake by shoots from ambient water. So, by the other words, whether or not there is an analogy with terrestrial carnivorous plants, at least for the genera Drosera, Pendicula, and perhaps Dionea, at which the leaf nutrient uptake greatly stimulates the mineral nutrient mineral nutrient uptake by roots. And we can ask what is the efficiency of absorption of mineral organic nutrients from prey because we know only one figure from uh, mosquito lurking from Utricularia vulgaris from one excellent study from the clinical results very difficult to conduct these experiments to repeat them for more species and so on. We can ask what is the role of organic substances including humic acids and tannins in the water, in the dystrophic water for the growth and development of these plants. And you can ask where are the phytohormones produced in the rootless aquatic carnivorous plants and how do they function? The, this question was has partly been uh, replied by our study three years old. So we studied uh, cytokinin and uh, auxin distribution in the plants and it's evident that the, that the phytohormones are produced in rootless shoots. But and it is mainly the polarity of cytokinin uh, content which probably uh, regulates the physiological polarity of the, of the utricularia and aldervana shoots. Yeah. Then the example of the polarity of ureon and the senescent or senescent segments. Otherwise, it's, uh, it is uh, the Australian Aldrovanda, perhaps from, from New South Wales, forming dormant turions, with, which are green with, uh, with uh, very red shoes. It's very spectacular. The Utricularia uh, resupinata and so, thank you for your attention and patience that I have, I have taken by 10% more of your time. Thank you.